So now we're going to talk about digital rights management as an introduction to the problem of trusted computing. So we'll cover these areas. So first of all, we'll start with what is DRM, uh, so digital rights management. And then we'll look at some historical approaches followed by more modern approaches. And finally, we will end with a short note on information hiding and watermarking, which is uh, something we, we need for uh, non-executable uh, data or media or uh, whatever the format is. So what is DRM? So the main purpose of DRM is to prevent piracy. Uh, this can be, be applied to all sorts of material from photos to films to application programs and all the way to operating systems. And uh, we will start talking about uh, application programs and operating systems and end with uh, material like photos and films, which is uh, in which we, for which we need to use information hiding. Now, there are different approaches and purposes. So for instance, to control piracy, but also to uh, control the selling of used products. Uh, although uh, that is questionable in many jurisdictions. Now, let's start with the historical approaches. So in the dawn of computing, uh, then software was given away for free by the hardware vendors because uh, the users needed software to be able to use their hardware. So uh, usually they uh, gave away some software with their hardware so the user uh, had some something to run. And also this uh, was a good promotion of their hardware if they had good software too then uh, that would also promote buying their hardware. However uh, in the 60s uh, this changed and software was by then a significant cost and uh, now the hardware vendors uh, charged extra for their operating systems and there were third par third party software vendors. And in the 70s, uh, this uh, changed even further because uh, in the 70s, we had the advent of the C programming language, which uh, made, uh, gave the possibility of turning uh, software into general packages. So before, uh, you had to write the software in some assembly language, which was very specific to the hardware uh, that you were using. But with a C programming language, you had a more high level language which wasn't tied to the hardware. So you could just compile for different uh, hardware platforms. Now, with this, uh, we got the problem that uh, code could be transferred uh, from project to project or, or uh, software package to software package. So one of the problems that arose was code uh, ownership. And uh, the main problem that companies had was that uh, maybe one of the company's programmers left for a competitor and soon their program uh, started to get some of the features of the previous company's uh, programs. So then uh, one had to determine if the programmer had just copied the source code and stolen it, or if they actually had reinvented it and rewritten it from scratch. So they had the idea of software birthmarks uh, that could be used. So analyzing uh, the source code itself to see how it was written. Uh, so if just the variable names were different, but the structure was the same, then probably it was copied and uh, someone just uh, renamed all the variables. But if the structure was completely different, if it was constructed uh, differently from the beginning, then it was more, more likely completely rewritten from scratch. And in that case, 
the programmer hadn't stolen the, uh, the source code. And then came the 80s with uh, the general purpose computer, so the PC, the personal computer. And uh, along with that came more attempts at copyright enforcement. So, because now people started copying the programs uh, instead of buying them new. So, one approach uh, to prevent uh, this kind of copying, this illegal copying, was to introduce in the program uh, a feature which uh, locked the program every now and then with an error message saying error X or some other, some error number, uh, please call technical support. And then uh, they, uh, the, the company or person who was running this program would call the technical support and the technical support would look uh, this error up, which would be a specific error message to, which is tied to who bought uh, the program. And that way they they see who is calling. So because they say that they are calling from this place and uh, uh, they have gotten this error. So then the tech support can just check if this error message corresponds to uh, the company that has bought the program. And uh, thus see if there has been some illegal copying. Now this worked for as long as uh, the users were technically unknowledgeable and it didn't cross the limit of what was considered reliable because if you do this too often then the program will be considered uh, unreliable because it uh, errors too often so we'd better buy something else which doesn't error as much. Uh, so uh, these were a bit dirty tricks that uh, could be used at the time. Other approaches was to for the software to look at the processor serial number. However, if you change the computer and install the program on another computer, uh, then it uh, would be uh, different and maybe it wouldn't work, although it's a totally legitimate uh, use case. And in summary, uh, throughout uh, history, uh, there had, has essentially been three general approaches uh, that I have tried. So the first one, uh, that one was to add uniqueness to the machine. So for instance, a hardware dongle. So many, many programs came with a hardware dongle and you needed to connect that one to the computer and then they install the program and the program talked to this uh, hardware dongle to uh, make sure that uh, as long as that one was connected to the computer system, then everything was fine and the program run, but you couldn't run the program without a hardware dongle. And that meant you got as many hardware dongles as you bought copies of the program, which meant, yeah, if you bought one copy of the program, you got one hardware dongle so you can use it once uh, or use it at one system at the same time. Uh, the second approach was to try to add uniqueness within the machine. So for instance, when you install the software, uh, it installs in a way that prevented naive copying. So for instance, if you have installed it, then you just can't copy the files from the hard drive to another uh, hard drive and continue running it. Uh, so for instance, uh, the program might install some system files uh, and spread the files all over the system. Uh, in some library uh, directories and things like that. Or as Adobe Photoshop did at some point uh, when they modified uh, the first sectors of the hard drive, so where the bootloader is. And uh, the assumption made by Adobe Photoshop people was that people were running Windows because Adobe Photoshop was a Windows program. So then they were using, the user would have the Windows bootloader and uh, then they wrote some, some special data to, to the second sector uh, and the Windows bootloader only uses the first one. However, people that uh, dual boot Windows and Linux, they have the Grub bootloader, which actually uses uh, more sectors in the beginning. So Adobe Photoshop overwrote that. So whenever this uh, 
this user that would have the grub bootloader instead, whenever they rebooted, after installing Adobe Photoshop, they would have a bricked system, uh, so they couldn't boot. Uh, so this was, of course, very bad, and people were very upset. Uh, so bad practice. Uh, and generally, people must be able to create a backup. Uh, they are entitled to that. But they shouldn't be able to copy those backups for sharing with other people. So this is known as the copy generation control problem. And the third approach was to use whatever uniqueness there already was in the system. So for instance, storing characteristics of the computer, uh, cards present, amount of memory, and so on. However, uh, this approach needs to handle hardware upgrades, since if you, if you expand your memory, uh, your programs shouldn't stop working. Uh, so you need to, to have some nice trade-off there uh, to see what was uh, likely. So this has indirectly been uh, the, the case for uh, Windows installations, because they, when you install it, it adapts uh, quite a lot to the hardware. So if you change something and uh, the chips, uh, like the motherboard chipset, uh, differentiates too much, then you have to reinstall it. But if it's a similar, uh, similar enough chipset, you you can actually uh, change the motherboard and the computer will still work uh, with that Windows installation afterwards. Um, so that has been the case of Windows. I don't know how it is today. Uh, more modern approaches is to have the software connect to the vendor servers to verify itself. Now this, of course, became uh, possible with the advent of uh, wide availability of uh, broadband connections uh, because that wouldn't be an appreciated uh, solution uh, for when people were on dial-up connections which cost per minute and uh, this of course works as long as the software isn't needed offline because then it's obviously a bad approach but even if it's online, it can be really annoying and cause a lot of problems. So for instance, uh, Ubisoft uh, introduced this kind of uh, DRM for Assassin's Creed, and they required a constant internet connection when you played. The problem was that in their case, they, the software was too strict about the connection. So even uh, one dropped package to, to the server uh, or one dropped packet to the server uh, could cause the uh, the game to to terminate, and then you lost all your progress uh, that you had since the last save, which annoyed a lot of people. Uh, so that was not appreciated. And uh, another uh, approach is to leave some critical part to be done by the vendor servers. So, for instance. Uh, Blizzard's Diablo 3 games uh, is an example of this because there they let the server handle the entire game even in single player mode. So they do map generation, non-playable characters and so on. So the only thing that you have on the client side is you have all the resources, so all the textures and, and graphics uh, is on the, uh, on the disk on the local system and uh, it can handle how to process the maps that it gets from the servers but it's it's the server that uh, runs the game sort of so it tells the the client on the on the user's computer uh, how to to present the game and uh, what should happen and so on yeah so the uh, one possibility with the with the Ubisoft uh, Assassin's Creed DRM was that that one uh, didn't have any critical part done by the server, it just checked that there was a connection. So people actually uh, wrote a software that was running locally on the computer, which uh, simulated Ubisoft servers and then uh, changed the hosts file so that the game connected to the local uh, the local running server instead, 
and hence the problem disappeared and uh, also the DRM, the purpose of the DRM was undone uh, completely too. Uh, but that's not possible when uh, there is more functionality being handled on the server side as, as was the case for the Diablo 3 games. Now, uh, the Blizzard approach might cause other problems uh, because now since uh, you need the servers to be able to use the product, then for how long do the, the manufacturer intend to support that product? Uh, because if I buy something, then I expect to be able to use it for as long as I like. But if they stop supporting the Diablo 3, then I can't play my game anymore, which I could uh, with a old school style of game, which uh, just required uh, the program to be installed. So uh, Sonos, uh, the smart speaker manufacturer, they, they uh, got a lot of heat uh, recently as of this video. Uh, they got a, a lot of heat for uh, actually doing precisely this because they said that uh, they would stop supporting uh, the legacy hardware that uh, they had manufactured and sold like 10 years ago uh, and don't provide it with any more updates or, or new features, which would mean that you couldn't use those products along with the newer products. Uh, so you would sort of uh, be stuck uh, at an old uh, at an old state for these uh, for these systems and you couldn't use it if you bought a new product from Sonos. You couldn't use these together, which uh, also upset people. Uh, although in this case you actually could continue using uh, your old uh, products. It was just that they, they couldn't use any new features and couldn't work with uh, the new systems, but it upset people quite a lot anyway. And yet another part, uh, another approach is to encrypt vital parts. So for instance, some code or video. So uh, this can be used for both software and media. So it's, uh, of course, the approach for DVD and Blu-ray and streaming services. Uh, because here you encrypt the the video, so the the contents of a DVD disc, for instance, is encrypted, uh, and uh, the keys are uh, specific to different regions of the world. And uh, all DVD players, if you buy a DVD player in Sweden, it will be uh, for a specific region like Europe, and it has the decryption keys for all uh, DVDs for this region. So if you buy a DVD from uh, in Sweden too, your DVD player can decrypt the content and you can read it. However, if you buy a DVD disc from another country like North America, uh, which is a separate region, then your Swedish DVD player can't decrypt this uh, because it doesn't have the keys. And the same thing goes for the DVD readers in uh, desktop computers and so on. Uh, so they need to, to have the, the correct keys to be able to decrypt these. Uh, however, uh, even in this problem, uh, you know that uh, you have to decrypt the, the disk and, and uh, at some point the material on the disk will be available unencrypted. So for instance, it's showing on the TV. Uh, so the TV must have it uh, unencrypted. Uh, however, they, they have tried uh, various attempts to, uh, the DVD uh, decrypts the disk and then you have uh, support for encrypted connections over HDMI and uh, DisplayPort uh, to try to prevent these problems so that you can't get the unencrypted uh, stream of data and uh, store it somewhere else and uh, publish it. However, uh, the, in the worst case scenario, they, they can obviously never prevent you from uh, just taking a camcorder and video record what you're seeing on screen. Uh, so 
However, that, that usually decreases the quality quite a lot, but uh, it's still, still possible to do. Uh, and at least with this approach, uh, as long as you, you have the DVD, DVD disc intact, and as long as you have the DVD player intact, you can use, continue to use the stuff. And as long as you have a TV, which has an uh, HDMI uh, plug or whatever uh, the DVD player is using, then you actually can use uh, this for as long as they are functioning. Now, the last, uh, last part is uh, about information hiding. So another approach, uh, if you want to be able to, to give away something for, for general purpose use, so like, uh, sure, we have the DVD, which is uh, some kind of media. Uh, there, there are other approaches there too, uh, to just give the uh, stream, uh, usable by by something and then adding something that's called uh, a watermark so something that's uh, not visible to the naked eye so you they modify the data in some way so for instance if you buy an, an ebook or something uh, you usually can use it on any device and it's uh, available in in plain text however there is a particular encoding uh, in the data which you can't see with a bare eye but if you know what you're looking for you can find it so in this case if you buy an ebook and uh, then the store actually watermarks it so that uh, if uh, you put that ebook on pirate bay for instance then the copyright owner if they find it there they can uh, go and read uh, read out this uh, watermark and see it was this store uh, who sold it and uh, it was this uh, customer number. So they just go to the store and say, hey, we found this one on Pirate Bay. Who bought uh, this uh, this issue of this book? And then they can get your, your name and uh, then they can, yeah, uh, report you to police or take you to court or whatever uh, they want to do. So this watermarking uses steganographic uh, methods, which uh, is different from cryptographic methods. So in cryptography, you you know it's there, but it's uh, it's unreadable. And in the purpose of steganography is to hide the fact that it's there, uh, so that you you can't detect it. Uh, so it's. Um, uh, yeah, its 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 purpose is to to hide uh, hide this uh, from the user, so the user can't find it. Uh, although the user knows it's there, you you can't find where it is in the book, so you can't remove it. Uh, however, if you have two copies, for instance, you can compare their differences, and then you can start finding uh, slight differences, which. Uh, uh, this steganogram, uh, which is exactly this uh, steganographic uh, message, so, so it's uh, quite easily removed in in some cases. And that was everything uh, for this time. Thanks for watching.